Hello and welcome to another episode. This week we're going to be delving back into the world of aerodynamics. However, this time actually I'm going to go into some detail around the design of this new Pikes Peak racer. On top of that, I'm going to cover some of the tools and methodologies I've used to go and do this designing. And finally, I'm going to actually change things up a little bit and take you into that world and, and run you through some of the design development process and how I've evolved the car design from very much a clean sheet design up to something that's reasonably developed and, and, and ready enough to go and do some detailed mechanical design around it. So please remember to like and subscribe if you're enjoying these videos and let's get to it. So first of all, I, I still cringe when I say I'm an aerodynamicist. Uh, honestly, I feel like I'm not. However, I've done quite a lot of aerodynamic design in my career. Um, and so it's at that point where I should probably say that I, I do that as well. However, I'm not like a traditional aerodynamicist where I am just doing this exclusively. And to be honest, to be really good at this subject, you, you kind of need to do that. Um, it's all encompassing. It's like a black art and, and there's never just one right answer. Um, anyway, with that, with that said, I, I will share with you uh, one book that really got me into this topic back when I was a teenager. Uh, it's called Imaginatively Written or titled Race Car Aerodynamics. It's by a chap called Joseph Katz. Um, available on Amazon for not too much money at all. And this is just a great foundation into all things uh, race car aerodynamics. It covers all the theories. Um, it's not too heavy or long winded as well. And it, and it goes into the detail of stuff you really need to know. You know, how an aerofoil works, what the different shapes do in an aerofoil, and then more car specific things like uh, ground effect and, and how dive planes work and uh, multiple flat wings work. All really, really useful information that you can lean on to go and do a good aerodynamic design on a car. Um, the next thing I was going to talk about is how I've gone about designing uh, the Wolf Aerodynamics that started back in 2018. Um, and those first wings we put on that car were essentially done with hand calculations uh, and some rough force and moments um, and some fudge factors to go and do a, a wing package. It was okay. Uh, we didn't quite have enough front-end downforce like we hoped, but overall worked pretty well. Um, the following year, we just did a front wing design in isolation with a friend doing the CFD. That was a little better. That worked great. And then uh, back in 2021, I worked with a chap called James Kamisiak out of the UK. His company is called Black Arts Customs, and we did full car CFD at that point. And that's really what moved that car along at that point. Um, but the biggest change for me actually is going and using a tool called Air Shaper. Uh, I used them first of all to go and optimize the performance of the Wolf when we went and ran that in some time attack events with Grid Life, doing both Laguna Seeker and Streets of Willows, setting the overall Streets of Willows lap record by, you know, I think it was like 11 seconds or something. We did the first sub minute uh, lap around there, and then also taking the car to Laguna Seeker uh, and running a 1 minute 10. Dot nine if i recall correctly which is about on pace with an indycar pole for that year so really quite fast and good um anyway this tool is fantastic because somebody like me who is you know knows about aerodynamics but isn't doing this as a full-time job every day um, i can go and use this tool and go and get really useful information um, and i would say that the greatest thing about this tool is its ability to mesh what do I mean by meshing? It's basically creating a network of nodes that we can apply a C a CFD calculations to, to um, Navier Stokes, all that good stuff. Um, and that process can be quite tricky to set up when you've, you know, if you know CFD and you've been doing it a long while, it's, it's, it's a, a very time consuming process. However, the methodology this, this, uh, this tool uses is a very clever one. Um, first we can take in a whole bunch of different 3D geometry from a CAD system. Um, the model doesn't have to be really neat and tidy that you would typically see in um, you know, a traditional CFD solver uh, or mesher. And um, it's able to go and figure that out and then go in what's essentially called adaptive meshing 
um, to go and make sure that mesh is pretty good for, for you know for what you're trying to to outcome with it. Um, it's also really quick to go and set up the whole experiment. So you know set set up your ground plane, your moving wheels, your attitude of the car, the scale of the car. If you want to go and put coolers, radiators in there, it does all of that, um, and it does it very quickly and very well. It's an online-based tool, so you don't need sophisticated computing equipment. I run this from my Mac a lot of the time. Um, it solves on the cloud, and you know, in a basic you know resolution setting that they have, you can go and get answers in sometimes less than half an hour. Um, so there's a few different. Um, Accuracy, accuracy settings that it has. You have basic, regular, and advanced. Each has different credits. You know, one credit for basic, ten for regular, fifty for advanced. I find most of my time when sketching out ideas and concepts, I'm actually just using basic. Basic's great for those big things, but how? Uh, but it's um, you know sometimes struggles with things like slot gaps, suspension, things like that. It'll sometimes fall over on, so it's not perfect. Um, regular is where most of you know the really good work is done um, and that can also model what's called porous objects and those are you know essentially like a sponge it allows an amount of air through a solid and that's how you go and model things like uh, radiators and intercoolers all that good stuff um, so I find myself doing you know when I'm doing very initial concept design maybe 10 runs on basic to get a good idea of the concept and going checking that on on a regular setting and going through that process around and around and around developing the concept of the car um, and and with this basic setting I can kind of get in five runs development runs in a day because it takes half an hour I've got to go and look through the results and then also create another model but that can happen pretty pretty quickly um, and what I'm using for the modeling is Autodesk Fusion that's been a really good tool and the thing I found really powerful there and it's a 3d CAD program and uh, they have a thing called t-spline surfacing and it's essentially like a, you know, a way to go and manipulate and shape particular surfaces using essentially splines and spline points. And you can go and drag and pull things to look like shapes of cars um, very, very quickly. So if you want to like tweak a fender shape or something like that, you can do that in a matter of minutes. Resave it and then rerun it. Uh, same with the underfloor. Diffuser shapes, intake shapes, all this good stuff. You can go and create a T-spline model and it's really, really quick to go and change and update. Um, so they've been the key things there that's allowed me to go and do that. Um, and then going and viewing the res these results, I typically just use uh, Air Shapers online viewer. It's good enough, I, th I find, for most things. And then when I'm wanting to get some you know, real detail on a particular area on the car, I'll export that model and I'll go and put it into Paraview and then I'll go and look at it there where I can understand maybe a little more. But you know, 95% of the time, the the uh, the online viewer is good enough. Um, so yeah, what I'd say is you know the key thing with this tool is it's so quick to iterate on. And when when you consider you know I'm an individual, I'm doing the design as well. This 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 whole workflow process happens so so quickly, and it's rare to see that in the professional world. If you're thinking about you know a traditional OEM that's got a CFD department and you've got a load of CAD designers, this iterative approach of you know just doing kind of one design study might take weeks at a time when I can do it in the you know in a matter of hours, and that's something really to you know consider and is very very powerful. Now Airshaper itself is you know not the gold standard of CFD. Um, you can get you know more accurate, more correlated simulations if you wanted to. You know, people like Formula One, I'm sure, is, is more sophisticated. But however, if you go and understand the tool and what its strengths are, I think you can get a great result out of it anyway. Um, and you see this, I mean, super fast Matt has been using the same tool with his Bonneville Landspeed Racer. Um, and it's just, just been such a fantastic, useful tool in that regard. I really enjoy using it. I think, you know, during this design and development process, kind of got addicted to it and learning about how flows work around in this particular type of race car and wanted to improve, improve, improve and iterate. And it's just been a fun process. I've loved it and I've enjoyed it. Um, and with that said, I'm really happy to take you into the world of my computer screen. And let's go and look through some of my designs and see how this unlimited racer has gone from essentially a sketch on a bit of paper through to a sketch in a 3D CAD program and then going and improving on that gradually and gradually. 
So the first sketches were done basically January 2024, and then this probably takes me up to about May time. And I'm taking you up to a point where uh, just before the concept of the car changed quite drastically. But anyway, enjoy the process. Hello and welcome to my computer screen. This is the AirShaper online viewer where we can go and look at all the designs. Um, and this is my very first model of the car I ran in this simulation. It's a little bit of a different design. I was trying to create a car that didn't need a front wing. I wanted to see if I could steer these wheel pods to create some side force and then rely on a heavily contoured floor to create most of the downforce. So this is Manta Baseline. Um, one of the other couple of unique ideas, or actually a couple of the other new, unique ideas is this diffuser that comes back to a point to reduce a drag and then the fully enclosed wheels. I thought that was a good baseline, lowest drag, most streamlined design I could do and then from here I could add downforce. Um, what do we see on the output? Actually pretty good low drag coefficient, reasonable lift coefficient. However, not much downforce on the front, as you would expect. Um, but a good baseline. And you can see here, the dark blue is where most of the downforce has been generated on the bottom of the car. And also the rear wing, and then the front. Here you can see this blue on the top, now that equates to lift on the top side. And red on the front equals drag. Blue on the back will also equal drag. So. Good first step. Okay, from here, well, let's go and look at a few things. So first of all, I needed to see if this idea of uh, steering the wheels was going to generate enough side force. Um, so most turns would be around, you know, four degrees where the aerodynamics would be ne meaningfully engaged. So you can see from the top profile, there's sort of front wheel pods are designed like a teardrop. Now, what kind of side force do we produce? Well, with that, you can see them. The uh, forces in newtons, why? Made a little bit of force, that's about 93 newtons, not much. Um, and basically, I went through the calculations here and figured out it'd be about 0.1 G of, uh, of steering from those wheel pods. So that idea wasn't really going to work out. Okay, never mind. Okay, well, let's add a front wing in, front kind of wing diffuser setup. How do we do that? Well, a good bit more front end downforce. Okay. Lift coefficient actually reduced a little bit. This front wing starves airflow to the floor. Um, and that means overall downforce was reduced, but we got balanced much more where we needed it. And you can see this big blue on the bottom there, that downforce balancing the car out. Interesting. Okay, well, next up, what should we do from here? Well, let's consider this, uh, you know, you've seen the last one, you had this fully integrated rear, rear wing which I thought might be a good idea to keep basically a low pressure of the rear of the car and really drive that diffuser. Well, is that actually doing what I expected? So I separated it to a, you know, a, a different end plate, separate end plate. How did those numbers compare? Well, what did we get? Lift, well, that went from 3.455 to 3.598. So actually we gained downforce and Oddly enough, most of that was around the front. Go figure. Uh, that was one of those weird effects. I didn't think too hard, but overall I could see that the, the downforce was improved. So um, I continued with this. Okay, well, having that rear wheel enclosed is a pain in the ass for you know running the car and um, changing wheels and all this good stuff. Well, how much is, is this enclosed rear wheel actually doing? Um, you know, 3.582 versus 3.598, you know, front to rear, very, very similar. So it's not really doing anything at all. So yeah, like we can just leave that. It's easier to run the car like that without the fully enclosed rear wheel and then a disc. That seemed to work pretty nicely. Okay, well, let's also investigate more into this rear fender. Now I cut away behind the rear tire. This is what we did on the Wolf to great effect. How does this compare? This is what we started with before, this kind of enclosed pod, directing the airflow out from the rear tire. And now we have this setup here, this, this cut engine 
engine cover here. Well, we have 3.73 lift coefficient versus 3.582, so that's a big bump in downforce. Um, all, mostly on the rear end, tiny bit on the front, which you typically get from an improved downforce on the rear. Okay, well, that's also another improvement. Interesting, we were removing parts of the rear of the car and actually gaining performance. Drag, 0.667, how are we there? 6.5, okay, we gain a bit of drag, 6.49, but still pretty much in the same realm. We're getting downforce improvement without as much drag, so we're actually improving lift to drag. So this next one, I actually look to see, well, if we leave a little gap between the top engine cover and the diffuser, reduce that diffuser height, what do we see there? Because I was a bit concerned about cooling flow out the back of the car. Well, 3.708 versus 3.73. And 667 versus 667. So actually we saw a slight reduction in downfalls without much change in drag. So not super sensitive there, surprisingly. Um, interesting. I was going to take that idea and move it forward. All right, this next one, I looked, okay, well, let's raise the engine cover and the rear wing because you have to do both, both together. What does that look like in the way of downforce now? Driving the rear of the car harder. What did we get there? Well, 3.905. That was a pretty big improvement in lift. But 667.667 to 0.772. Actually, efficiency was lacking a little bit there. So interesting to think. We've got this tool where we can generate a bit more downforce on the rear if we raise that engine cover up. But actually, it's, it's kind of expensive when it comes to drag. Good to know. Okay, the next one. Um, we went back to the original engine cover design. That seemed to do better. Now let's go and put in a wider rear wing. How does that do? I don't want to be changing flap angles or anything at this stage because I'm trying to look at the general car design. I can tweak in the wings and adjust them once the car design is mature. What do we get there? Well, we're down at 0.658 and then we're at lift coefficient of 3.876. So our previous best next one. That's a little more rear end downforce, 667, 658. Actually, we've reduced drag as well. So um, that's a positive change in itself there. Good and great. Okay, the next one. Now we're looking at the front wheels. Just like the rear, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to have those wheels enclosed. There's there's a lot of work to do there. And in reality, that's, that's not going to work out because I'm going to have to steer those wheels. That isn't realistic. So let's go make these front wheel pods a bit more realistic. Here we know 3.795.698. Well, the drag's gone up, and then the 875, 370, so downforce has gone down. But I kind of knew that previous design, well, that's not real because I couldn't steer those wheels and those pods. And, you know, this, this is more of a, a realistic setup of car. So I've got to move forward within this. It's not such a bigger hit as well to those performances. So do you know what? I'm going to run the front wheels open. So actually now the concept of the car is quite different to where we started. All the wheels are exposed, the rear bodywork is cut away, and, and you know the car is easier to use and, and the aerodynamic performance is a bit better. So now I start tweaking things a little bit. You know, I've put some center discs on the front to improve the drag there. I've tweaked a few profiles and I've also started raising the center section. I could see on that very first simulation run that the floor was actually working its best at that point. Um, and the front wing was getting in the way of that downfall. So if I raise the center section, well, how does that do? I'm down, lift coefficient is down though. Front lift is also really bad. Okay, interesting. Well, that didn't do what I wanted it to. So let's keep looking for more performance. The next one was, well, the Wolf seemed pretty successful. Why don't I just try the Wolf front end on it? How does that do? Um, that's an idea. And you look here pretty terribly. Lift coefficient goes really down. There is a lot of front, a lot more front lift on this thing now. So I, mean, I know that front wing works. It works well on the Wolf, but that really just starves everything else of the car and how it works. So, OK, I could do that, but the rear end of the car stops working. Interesting, though. How about, OK, well, it's the rear end of the car. Could that work better if I then fare in the, the front tires? Does that help things? We go to 6863441. Yes, that does actually. It reduces drag, improves downforce. That was kind of promising. Um, looks a bit ugly. I also, oh, you can see here as well, I trimmed out the rear, the front wing flaps as well. You can see they're backed off versus them wound in all the way there. So that's really that, you know, snow plow effect happening. 
So I can do things like I can go and look at the individual forces on different parts of the car, see how much you know drag or downforce each one of these pieces contributing. This is one of the things I did to go and evaluate between different designs. You can look at the floor and separation, all that good stuff. So I can identify what was working and what wasn't. All right, the next one. Let's try and go away from that wolf wing. See if we can make the front wing work a bit better with this with this high center. Now I go and kick up the uh, the exit of it, make it work a little bit harder as a diffuser. Where am I now? Well, improved improve the downforce a little bit, and the balance is about there, but with a bit of drag. I'm starting to accept these drag penalties now as I'm turning this from more of a sketch into a you know a car that would work. It's still very much a sketch still. But um, um, you know, I'm having to be realistic about it. You know, the first sketch I did of a car was never really going to go and work. So I'm seeing improvements, and I'm you know, sometimes the numbers aren't you know going up, but overall the car is doing a little better. Um, this next one was okay. Well, I've also got to consider the car at different attitudes. I've got to go and run this at a really low ride height to see if the floor stalls out. How does that go and do? And at this point. With this land on the ground, lift coefficient of 3.547. The front you can see is actually engaging a bit more and drag is still not too bad. So if we see here, actually the downforce goes down a little bit and but the rear end downforce reduces a lot more. So really, you know, from a porpoising point of view, it looks like this will do pretty well. Um, but we will see quite a lot of back balance mitigation to the front. And I think that's really when the front wing is engaging a lot harder. And the floor itself is actually designed in a pretty good way. Good to know. Okay, the next one. Um, what I've done here is added some, uh, some more, you know, some more detail into the car. I've dropped this front splitter height exit. I've added another... Um, Vortex generated to the floor. I'm just now experimenting with different pieces on there and going through these different workspaces to see what I get at the end of it. You can still see here I'm really struggling with the essentially the tire squirt that I'm getting from the rear tire and how that's affecting the tunnel. I know that's having a huge performance deficit. But actually the front end and these front wheels is working pretty good. What I found was, you know, you don't actually need to cover much of the front tire to uh to get a to get a performance increase you know because the tires rotating most of the headaches on the top side of the tire this back side over here this actually generates downfalls this portion of the tire is quite handy and this is why you see on the back cutting this away actually helps things because it essentially keeps the airline as streamlined as air flow as streamlined as possible behind that tire and the movement on that tire here actually creates a little bit of downforce and it's only at the top where we're seeing this surface friction. So this is where it's creating a load of drag and turbulence from the airflow. Because this up here is going twice the speed of down here. You know, here is the speed of the ground at zero mile an hour. Up here is twice the speed. So that's why you see that. And surface friction as well, you can also see the streamlines, how that is all working. All right. Then we go to, you know, you have vertical streamlines here as well. You can see how the airflow is working. And drag it across the car and we can also see the horizontal streamlines how that's working that goes over the car i really like going and seeing the very much the stuff on the floor and just above you can see how the underfloor is working you can see vortex is being formed as well and how like the, the vortex generators are working so yeah this is all very much concept design understanding the sensitivity of it um the last thing I did, I call this Manta V7. Um, the previous design, you can see there is no suspension. Uh, it's just not so good. Uh, here we go. So especially, there's no suspension in the diffuser. I'm doing what's called a high lower control arm, and that control arm sits above the tunnel, so we can have a really clean tunnel. But that does restrict how high you can expand around the rear suspension. You know, I'm limited in the height because of that, so I can only work the diffuser so hard up to that point and then I have to kick up quite aggressively thereafter. Well this one, Manta V7, I decided well you know knowing it's really hard to uh, make these you know tunnels work with partial suspension all that getting the geometry to line up but why don't I put all the suspension and drive shaft in there how does that work? Um, you can also see that you know with this basic setting of of a simulation you don't you kind of get partial arms and stuff but it's still enough to get an idea 
And what I see of this concept actually, it worked pretty well. Uh, ended up being quite a big jump in drag, but also a big jump in downforce. Um, and with really, really good balance, actually brought the balance forward. So that looked promising as well. So I essentially had two concepts at the end of this design cycle, like a low floor, low drag, drag coefficient of 0.7, lift co coefficient of minus 3.715, and then I'm up to 4.1 through 136, but then 791. So I, I think the efficiency was pretty close in the end. I have a spreadsheet tracking all these numbers. Both concepts seemed feasible. Um, and this essentially took me to the point of um, having a rough car design idea that I could go and start mechanically lying out the bones underneath it and doing a bunch more design there, maturing the car along before I come back and go and, you know, with all that mechanical design detail put in, I could go back with a more accurate aero model um, you know, mechanically, you know, mechanical systems-wise, so I can then continue the development of the car. So overall, these numbers are pretty good. I wasn't blown away with them. Um, they were around what the Wolf was. In fact, just a little bit less, but the overall efficiency was up. Um, so I thought this was a really good starting point, and it sort of lined up with you know the visuals I wanted to do on the car of it looking kind of spaceshipy, futuristic, um, a slippery design that then you know I can go and add more aerodynamic pieces on, you know, wind in the rear wing, make more downforce, um, do more flips and flaps, all that good stuff, but trying to get the, the baseline of the car working pretty well. So there you have it. That's That took me up, actually, this was mid-March, um, this car, so a long time ago, and from there I really started to sketch out the structure of the car and think about, you know, how I was going to actually make this. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big endeavor to go and make a car. Um, but I had a baseline, I had a sketch to go and start with, you know, things like, does the driver fit? You know, does the suspension work? Uh, can I, can I package all the bits and pieces I want to in the car? So that's where I went from here. Anyway, back to me in the, I'm not going to call it the studio, but the studio and I'll, uh, run through some, uh, some, uh, user questions with you. Thank you for watching. Okay. Welcome back. We're now going to touch on a couple questions. Uh, first question comes in from Russell Jameen4715. Sorry if I murdered that one. Is it possible to use a restrictor on the dyno to simulate the top of the mountain for testing? Um, so this question is essentially covering how do you go and uh, simulate low density air, which we see at the top of the mountain at Pike's Peak. And it's possible to use a restrictor to go and do that. Um, the short answer is yes, you can actually do something like that. Um, the, the tricky thing with the restrictor is that that restriction will be right for that particular low point in the in the rev range um, and, and you know, throttle plate opening of the actual engine. So you'll always have to continually adjust that restriction to get the correct you know, inlet intake pressure. Um, to go and simulate the mountain. So that's the first thing where it's, you know, it's it makes the, the process of dynamic engine a lot more long-winded. And then the second thing is actually the, the pressure that the exhaust sees. The exhaust pressure is still seeing, you know, ambient, which is going to be too high. So you're going to get a different result there as well. Um, so you can do that. It helps, but it's also a bit long-winded and it's not the whole answer. Um, you do have some really expensive OEM engine dynos that can take the essentially the air pressure of the whole room down and they can go and do really, really high altitude as well. Um, but that's not really of access to us. And, and um, I mean, we have a good methodology now where we go and, you know, run first of all at slightly high altitude. You know, that's essentially Streets of Willows, which is a couple thousand feet over in California and then we go to Denver and we do some testing you know at Colorado um, whether that be in the dyno or at a racetrack that's going to give us another data point and from there we can kind of look at that curve and see what we're going to get on the mountain have a good understanding good enough to get us on the mountain and get the tune close and then the rest of it is you know is fine tuning the next one comes from Lindsay Dempsey 5683 um one query, one query for open exhaust systems with aftermarket turbos with 
integral waste gates, can those sometimes have trouble maintaining boost control at higher RPM? Are you confident that the integral wastegate of your selected turbo will have enough flow potential to adequately control boost at high RPM? Great question. Essentially, I believe what you're talking about is what's called boost creep. And that's with these internal wastegates at the higher RPMs, it can be hard to essentially wastegate enough of the exhaust gas to achieve the boost pressure you, you want and need. Um, and this can be an issue, say, if you're using a big turbo at sea level and you don't want much boost pressure. You can only let, you know, wastegate so much gas. You can only let so much gas go past the turbine wheel and just straight to the exhaust system. And with that fully open, you're still going to create some boost with the turbo. Um, but with us, I haven't found that to be a problem. Um, and because I've known this from running the Wolf, and we, we never need to fully open that, that valve to... Um, to get the boost target we're trying to achieve. Um, we have ran the engines before with a fully open wastegate and we do make boost like that. But what we find is the boost targets that we're aiming for is always a lot higher than that, that baseline uh, boost pressure you'll get with the flow in the turbine wheel. So it doesn't become an issue for us. Um, yeah, we, because of the you know, size of the turbo correctly, we, essentially we, we don't really have that headache. Um, but yeah, really good question. Some people might. Last one is Alex Topfer 1068. Uh, any consideration of compound supercharging systems, including turbos like they used in old World War II planes and some rally cars? I'm guessing it's a case of complexity and weight isn't worth it. Um, I need to do some background reading on World War II planes. I haven't looked too much into that, but I am familiar with the rally car systems. Um, and also I have experience being on the mountain. Um, essentially, you answered your own question. In the end of the day, the complexity and weight isn't worth it. Um, I've seen this, one of the guys on our team called Tim Whitteridge of Motorsport Electronics also. He's done compound systems. He's done rocket anti-lag. He's done a bunch of stuff with that, um, with various different cars on the mountain. Um, these ideas are tried out. And in reality, the the headache of going doing the system and the performance advantage you get is typically doesn't outweigh the system being there. I know that with the compound setup with internal with uh, gasoline cars, you can you're better off finding the right size turbo to do your job rather than adding all this system onto the car. I mean, one of the things we had when last year at Pikes Peak in 2023 when we did the fresh air anti lag. Um, that going putting that system on the car ended up being you know complex and the the performance increase we got from that system was was marginal compared to just a regular anti lag, so I see that you know as as, as kind of similar to also these com, you know complex compound systems, the single turbo or a twin turbo setup but just a conventional parallel one. Um, is good enough for the mountain. Like I said, at the top, it's becoming marginal, but everything before that is good enough. Um, and the sim simplicity of it really just reigns supreme when it comes to ultimate performance. So um, that's why I've shied away from compounding stuff. There's always like the little e-turbos are fascinating and interesting. Um, you go and look at say the diesel cars, that's when compounding really is important because you need such high pressure ratios to go and make the power so you see in diesel cars on the mountain absolutely yes but gasoline type vehicles it's i still think uh, just a conventional turbocharging system is better so yeah there are your questions answered thank you for your time i'll catch you in the next one please like and subscribe